Morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Sensei. Where's my co poet competitor? <laughs> Chase, good morning, Chase. Morning, everybody. Morning, Dave. Morning, good morning, Tom. Good morning. Tom. We got anybody else today? Give it just a minute. Lonnie will not be with us. He is out Christmas shopping, helping Santa. Sensei, does the person on your right constitute a safe individual? He, he, he's got a shirt. Oh, this, is, this is Darren. He drove, <laughs> he drove, he drove in from uh, New Orleans this morning. <laughs> that's that's, that's, you know, that's commitment. <laughs> <laughs> you should see his, his yellow Maserati ticket car. <laughs> is yellow referred to as a ticket car? Yes. You know yes. What I mean? <laughs> is there anyone who does not know what a ticket car is? I've never owned one, but I know what they are. Right. <laughs> They're yellow. It's the most visible to police. You're right. <laughs> anyway, okay, I think this is going to be it for now. So we'll leave this sidebar up here for a bit. Uh, do we want to quickly or introduce ourselves? Starting with this wonderful gentleman to my right here. Okay. Hi everyone, good morning. Darren Mallorine from New Orleans, Louisiana, here in beautiful Santa Clarita, visiting Sensei Kirby today and happy to be in front of everyone. Thomas, uh, you're next. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thomas Gentry, I'm in uh, sunny but going to be cold soon, Southern Illinois, and good to be with everyone. Jonathan? Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan. I'm in Oregon on the central coast of the state, enjoying the rain and the cold wind. Ah, Got to send some of that stuff down here. <laughs> okay, Chase. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm in Baltimore enjoying the very indecisive weather that Maryland provides. <laughs> I hear it's going to be very warm next week, and I'm slightly confused, but, you know, such is over here in Crabland. Okay, Dave. Good morning. I'm uh, Dave Clark in and, uh, uh, and beautiful sunny Florida. No clouds in the sky, but it got down to 49, 48 this week, and we have a fire in the fireplace as we speak. I, I left that fire in the fireplace to come to this meeting. <laughs> so okay. it does get cold enough in Florida. <laughs> okay, Tom. Uh, good morning. I'm Tom Deneen. I'm usually in Baltimore, uh, just like Chase, I've, I've often trained with Chase. Now I'm, uh, today I happen to be uh, outside Philadelphia at my parents' house, helping them out. Uh, glad to be here. Okay, very good. I'm George Kirby in, in Valencia, California, where it's supposed to be, I think in the high 70s today, clear, uh, It'll be going down to the 40s tonight, and theoretically, tomorrow we're having rain. <laughs> but in Southern California, there are no guarantees. Uh, okay. Okay, we have some topics today, and I don't know how many we'll get through. Um, and uh, uh, Darren has come up with a couple of additional ones that will be added to our list. Uh, but anyway, uh, the first one says is uh, probably from Gary Whitus uh, that's been really modified because it, it, it ultimately is a synopsis of three or four different questions that he thinks that he put up. And uh, uh, Basically, learning can be serious and still be a positive, fun experience. The dojo atmosphere is up to the sensei. Example, we learn more from making mistakes rather than doing things right. So providing an environment where students are not afraid of making mistakes is essential for positive learning and reinforcement. Okay, does anybody want to do anything with that? I I'm, agree I'm, with it. I'll agree with it wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody yeah. want to go further than that? <laughs> yeah, I'm confused as to like what the what the statement is. Like, are we? 
I feel like it class environment is just so individual that it's kind of like weird to talk about. Because if you don't like how one sensei runs their class, you know, just go find one, whether it's a, the same martial art or a different martial art, like go find a teacher that you enjoy. And that's when you'll learn the best. Right? Okay. Uh I mean, that's the way things basically happen in this country today. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> regardless of what we'd like to believe. Um, um, I don't know if the word fun is, is uh, I, I differentiate fun from, well, maybe I don't, fun from, if, if people have a positive experience, they consider it fun. Right. I don't know. I think, Professor, uh, one thing that, that Gary's probably touching on is I know he's an academic as well as other things, uh, and my background's similar. When you're engaging students, topic doesn't necessarily have to determine engagement. It's as much what you do in your teaching. And if you're, if you're teaching to a relationship to, to, to establishing a moment, for example, I think I've shared this before. Um, in my children's classes, especially, one thing that we regularly do is at the end, we'll all the kids line up and we say, tell us one thing that was really helpful today that you learned and that makes you want to come back. And so it's just, it's engaging them. Um, I, I think that's what it comes down to. I've learned over the years, teaching as much as an art as a science. And, and if, you, if you try to be... Uh, truly in tune with your students as much as you can, then the environment, it, it becomes resonant and you capture all that positive energy among the students, even if they're not style lovers, they'll, that, that's what I suspect Gary's driving at. And that's how I would approach that. And so I do think it can be fun without being um, shallow. Right. Right. I, I think that's a good clarification there. A couple uh, other things I'd, I'd throw in. Um, Enthusiasm is contagious, mm. and if, if you, uh, you you come in with a, a, a lot of enthusiasm, it's it, it's hard for even the most reticent students not to jump on board at, at some point, usually early on. Another thing I'll tell you is that um, I, I would have gotten into self-defense years earlier. I went to several dojos as a teenager and um, didn't didn't like the experience at all. I never went back because all I could all I could sense was the egos bouncing off the wall. And I wasn't there to, to, to bow down and kowtow to the eighth degree sensei. You know, uh, I was there to learn. If, if, they, if it was obvious that I was there to learn and they could teach me, I was interested. But past that, you know, I, I'm not there to satisfy your big old oversized ego. <laughs> so yeah, I Dave, I, I think one point you just brought up uh, that if there's object, if we are teaching objective based martial arts, so. For example, today we're going to learn how to defend against a round punch using this, and you contextualize it and and make it real world as much as you can. I have personally found it's really hard for ego to jump into. This is a common technique that we can all learn. Now, I've met people who could still make it about them, but I, I think what you're saying, Dave, is right. That's a huge turnoff. And when I look back personally and think about the times when I have lost a student that I know it was directly attributable to me, I, I had somehow uh, let the wrong things become the priorities. And I didn't blame them once I realized, okay, I, I wouldn't want me as a teacher after that either. So, How do you guys deal with, um, in, the, in combat sports uh, gyms, we call them gym cancers, like the people who come in with the, uh, with maybe not the right mindset or maybe a different expectation of like what your class is or something. And for whatever reason, like their synergy just isn't with the tone or the culture of the class, but like, you don't want to make a, make a thing of it, you know, like, you don't want to just like straight out, like kick them out, but like, maybe you do like, what do you guys do when that kind of stuff happens? You keep a stack of flyers from the other schools and offer to pay their first month over there. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, usually, I found in my experience, those, those people will usually leave mm -hmm. within two or three weeks, I mean, two or three classes, uh, 
because they, uh, assuming they even get on the mat, uh, mm -hmm. I have, we, we, we try to read people when they come. Most people are okay, but occasionally get a really weird person who's coming in the class and you, you know, you ask them, why are you here? I mean, it's a park program, but you ask them, why are you here? What are you hoping to learn? Uh, I think the most extreme case we had was a gentleman who came in, he crossed off half the stuff from the release. <laughs> and uh, That's I said, you, know, you can't do that. And, and, and uh, I said, we, you either have to agree to the whole thing or you go back to the city and they will give you your money back. <laughs> and which didn't make him happy. But as I handed him his uh, leather jacket, uh, he had a roll of quarters in, in his right-hand pocket. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a roll of quarters is good for, no. well, you see, if you're going to hit someone and you've got a roll of quarters in your hand mm. or even nickels, mm. that really gives your fist a lot of support. I forget what the term is used. Uh, it's, almost a, uh, uh, it's almost like a brass knuckle. That's my favorite way to use the alarm. Yeah, there's, no there's no give. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was almost tempted at that point to talk him on for a while. And we have a procedure in our class, which I've learned from years ago, decades ago, when we had a drunk walk in, um, <laughs> which was a unique experience. Um, where I'll just give a code word to one of the upper black belts, and they would call the police. Um, Oh, that's a good one. Because my attitude was, if a guy's walking around with a roll of quarters or in his coat pocket, this is someone who's might have a track record somewhere, and you don't want him. You know, he's looking for a situation, or he's looking for a fight, or what have you. And I didn't want to go there with this person, but uh, I decided since he was leaving, uh, I figured just let it slide. Um, but yeah, you 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 have to. A sense's responsibility is to sift. How do you say sift the students? Mm -hmm. And and uh, some of them will. Uh, you, you, you man, I managed to get rid of them within three or four weeks. And it's and it's not it's they'll come up and say you know I want to learn this I want to learn that can't I do this and I'll say no. Uh, I had one student who kept showing up in, uh, it's a white belt, showing up in various Kung Fu outfits. <laughs> <laughs> with Patty. That visual is killing me. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'll humor, oh, I'll, humor, no. I'll humor a kid for a couple of weeks. You know, I'll say, you know, this isn't appropriate. You know, just wear street clothes. And, and finally I said, this isn't the place for, for all that. If mm -hmm. you know, this isn't a movie, this isn't a game. If you're here, you're here to learn traditional jujitsu. And if you don't want to do that, I, you know, I'm sorry to say there's the door, but it's, it's, it, I try to let students make the decision themselves. Right. Um, I don't think I've ever thrown anyone out of the class in 54 years but you you put them you have to put them in a position where they have to make a decision as as seki said uh my sense he said he, he would, he'd say to students you can either do this or there's the door and that, that's how he was he was very black and white about things and uh i try to be a bit more try to be more tactful uh ultimately it's it's a black and white you know you either you have to either get with the program or there's the door. So, Professor, I, I, uh, I'm curious. This is a related topic, I think. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I pastor and I teach martial arts. And I had a scenario some years back, and I, I often find myself reflecting, did I do this the right way? Where I had a student, uh, an adult male in martial arts, um, very interested in the arts, did well. Um, they were also part of that. They through the martial arts, they started coming to the church I serve and I do a good bit of counseling. And he and his spouse came in for counseling 
and I became aware of a substantiated domestic abuse situation happening in the home. And it was the student who was the abuser of his spouse. And of course, I'm in a, I have a cloak of uh, confidentiality as a minister, but I'm also his sensei. And the decision I made was, and I pulled him aside, I said, listen, this is a, a weird situation for you, but I cannot continue to teach you in martial arts. I know you're having a domestic issue at home. And it caused all kinds of grief for me. Um, I'm just curious what your thought on that scenario, <laughs> crazy as it is, it's real, uh, is. I wouldn't want to be in that position. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the challenge. Agreed. That's, 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 a, that's a real moral challenge. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know as, as, a, as a school teacher, there are certain conditions where I had to notify uh, the administration or even in some cases notice, notify law enforcement directly uh, in California. And there were have been a couple of situations where I've had to do that, which I don't care to do because it, it, it really hurts. Uh, I always held a, a great deal of confidentiality with my students. And it's, I'm sure you know, Thomas, if, if you can keep your mouth shut, it's amazing how much you can learn from other people. Um, <laughs> and, and that's something I try to instill on, in my black belts. You know, it's, it's <clears throat> people will tell you things if they trust you. And you have to maintain that trust and it's very hard to break that trust. You know, and the same thing applies whether you're a teacher or a gang member, surprisingly. There, there's, it, it's, on the one hand, you're keeping secrets, but the other side is you're maintaining their, the, another person's trust. And that, to me, as, an, as a teacher, is extremely important. Um, and, but sometimes you do have to break it. Usually, I, usually if I could, uh, if I suspected something, I would say to the student, you realize, you know, I'm seeing all these bruises on your arms or things of this sort. I have, to, I have to call the police. I said, this is, this is not my decision. If, if I don't do it, I can go to jail. And I don't have any desire to do that. Uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're, they, they're pretty understanding. Um, but it, it does, it has happened. And it, it's hard um, because you're hurt. You, in essence, you're you're you may be saving one person, but you're hurting others in the process, or you may be hurting that that person in the process. I don't know what I would have done. Uh, I would have said, you know, you. you you probably made the right decision. You can't continue with the martial arts training because uh, it, it, it's either that or I go to law enforcement, you know, you, because I'm in a very difficult position. And, and if you do that, you've given them a choice. It's, it, it, it's in their, I'd say it, uh, their, <laughs> it's in their box. It's in their, Ball's in their court, yes. The ball is in their court. And I found it, I hate to say it in life, um, and I, I learned this from taking a class on how to become a good school administrator. Uh, the more times you can get other people to make decisions rather than you, <laughs> the the better the system works. Sensei, I like to add to yeah. what TJ was going through. It was um, that had to be an extremely difficult position for you, and I would have to applaud your your decision. I mean, you know firsthand what that person is going through and what's happening, and you have that that oath for you know in confidence of who you're working with, you know, as a pastor, but then also having someone as a student and, and being a sensei and, and making that moral decision. Um, I would applaud that. I mean, I think he made the right decision, in my opinion. Um, well, one. thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, and then to Chase, <laughs> Chase's credit, uh, and, and some of the things that he had mentioned, I, I've seen numerous people coming in and out, out of the dojo um, that are involved in combat sports, and 
a lot of times I would, I would just call them floaters. A lot of times when they come in, they're looking for a specific niche or even just to, to train themselves or to test themselves against people that mm-hmm. are on that, which is not what we're, that's not what we're about. That's not what we're looking for. So I always try to have a class when I identify one of those individuals after I kind of vet them a little bit and figure out a reason why they're there um, because they're never in line with, if, if you look at your current students, they're never in line with the objective um, of what your, the students that are there in a sincere reason. Um, right. they're, they're there for a specific reason, and that's to, to be able to test themselves with people that they have available to them and on the mat. So I always like to go outside of their comfort zone or what they're looking for because they don't understand. They only know, they only know what they think they hear about jujitsu and what it is. Mm-hmm. So they're looking for a specific thing to be able to compete in one of the combat sports that's regulated by rules, right? So I like to go outside of what their comfort zone is and they're like wait up i didn't i didn't know that this was what this was about or i'm not familiar with that or that's not why i'm here i want to i want to grapple or i want to do ground and pound how do i get to this and you know i say well it takes time and as you develop then we'll get to those things but it takes time to get there and usually those people want to be on a fast track to something and they feel like they could advance into this expert level type individuals so they can compete in one of these combat sports um, organizations and they they get quickly tired of it and they, and they just leave on their own. Okay. What I, I've had MMA people come, when I, particularly when I taught at the local college uh, before they had budget cuts, um, I'd have at least one or two MMA people every semester come in and they'd want to go to the ground with me and grapple. And I would say, okay, I will do, I said, I'm going to put you in a wrist press on the ground first. If you can get out of that, I'll grapple with you. I never had to grapple with any of them. And <laughs> I, I, you know, you can control the pain and they would flop back and forth like a fish, but they couldn't get out of it. Um, and then I said, that's what jujitsu is. And they were in the course, they were, you know, we didn't have to have any discussion. They were in the class, they were fine. They, they went along with the program. And uh, um, sometimes you can be subtle with people, but sometimes you have to be direct. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, usually if, 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 we have a very low injury rate uh, in jujitsu, tr- surprisingly traditional jujitsu. Even Seki had a very low injury rate. Um, and one of the things, if, if we have an injury, we tend to check it out as to what caused it, what could prevent it. And, and if I have a student that I believe intentionally caused an injury, I might be out of their carelessness. We'd have a talk and I'd say, you know, this, I know you, you didn't mean to hurt this person, uh, but they suspect, you know, they sustained a sprained or broken wrist or something like that. And, uh, you have to be more careful. Mm-hmm. This is your warning because this injury could have been avoided. There are injuries that can't be avoided, and those you just have to slide. But some people, yeah, been their, their yeah. attitude is, you know, I'm going to prove myself, and uh, I'll say if this happens again, you're going to have to leave the dojo because I can't have someone in the class who's out to intentionally hurt another person. Uh, George, yes. I need that picture of Biden when you have a chance time. Okay, it won't be for another hour or so. I can't okay. do it right now. Okay. Um, so it, um, you know, you have to, you have to be fair with your students, but you know, uh, and most of the time they get their act together. Yeah, yeah. They, they decide they'd prefer to be in the class than kicked out because they are intentionally injuring people. Um, George, I just wanted to throw in that in light of all these questions that have been, that have arisen and returning to the, the point of the original question, Dojo. Yes, Addison, yes. I'm wondering if you or anyone else has ever tried to establish a, re- a re- review process, maybe an annual one, not just uh reviewing students kind of informally, not, not a review for rank or anything like that, but just sort of discussing progress. Uh, 
And that might work both ways, going upward and downward, where students might review uh, the approaches of the sensei and the atmosphere that's established in the dojo. Uh, it's common in the corporate world where upward and downward, downward reviews are in place. And if a, if a sensei is really doing stuff that, that uh, turns off a lot of students or seems inappropriate, not, not violating boundaries, but... In, in, in my case, sensei will sometimes go over, over the allotted class time by a long time and you feel obligated to stay in a class when you might have other stuff going on on a given day or they do, uh, uh, they do exercises that um, turn off everyone and no one understands the point of going through things. And this review process might, uh, might offer an opportunity for sensei to realize that, wow, I, I didn't realize I was doing that wrong or I could be improving in this area. And I think it's a very healthy thing in the corporate world. Um, your, your experience with Seki, there's the old school experience, which tends to be, listen, this is what I, this is how I teach jujitsu, or this is, this is my way. And if you don't like it, that's, that's it. And that attitude, um, I, I get that attitude, but it seems to be changing. Um, uh, not just in the martial arts world, but in the world overall, that there's more authority is questioned more that you can question leaders without it being offensive to them. And I'm wondering if that might be a healthy thing to explore in dojos. I think it's a great idea. Cause like, you know, sometimes after class, you know, you stick around and you talk with people for a little bit. And I guess like these kinds of things can come up, but it can take a long time for those kinds of things to come up, you know, especially like, you know, you gotta, you know, leave and then get up for work in the in the morning. You know, um, but no, I think I think this is a good, real. That's a really good idea because then you, you can like not only talk about uh, those kinds of things, but then talk about like goals and where you see yourself in the martial art and like your relationship with your progress, whether it's increasing or slowing, and also like really open up the discussion to like have like more technical discussions about the martial art and your understanding of it. That's really cool. I'm yeah, gonna start doing that. There, a lot of it has to do, I think, with the ability of the sensei to interact with the students, to respect them, um, but to be able to interact with them on a one-to-one -one basis, because that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's what builds, that's what builds a program and that's what builds an effective class is is you you can't be uh my first principal did not like talking heads is there anyone who does not know what a talking head is right now we're all talking heads <laughs> we're up in front of a class or something like that and we talk we show a technique and then we wait for the students to try and do it um that my, my principal got rid of teachers that were talking heads. Um, he expected teachers to be out in the classroom, moving around, helping students on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think that applies to the martial arts as well. And that's probably as why, as Chase is saying, it's there's a transition. And I think Thomas is, we, we've all kind of know that, that we, we don't look at being challenged uh, as being a challenge to our authority. Um, because we all know we can ultimately say to a student, there's the door. But that's to, not, uh, your, that's to not Tom's, your, I'm sorry, Professor. Your, I'm sorry. Your intention is not to get rid of students, but to keep them. And uh, so you have to engage them. You have to be, you have to be willing to listen to them because sometimes uh, I've got some of my, even in the classroom, I've gotten some of my best teaching ideas from my students. And if they feel safe enough, they will speak up. <laughs> Go ahead. In, uh, in working to Tom's point a little further also in one of the hats I wear is a, a professor and I, I work with a lot of doctoral students um, and not all, but many doctoral students are actually planning to be professors and so there's a there's a, a, a phrase that has come in vogue with the right with the advent of more uh online virtual learning and the rapid increase in adult self-directed learners and it's that 
the, the teacher should seek less to be what, what is called the sage on the stage and more the guide by the side. Right. And I think that, that integrating that Tom with what in the military, we call the leadership 360 evaluation every year, someone ahead of you, someone, your peer, someone you were supervising would evaluate you. I think that that has real merit. I've not done that in the martial arts setting, but I think there's something to what you're saying. Yeah. And in academia, um, this is sort of institutionalized and, uh, and rate my professor, rate my professors and maybe on the secondary school level, it's rate my teachers where, mm -hmm. um, and it was uncomfortable for a lot of, a lot of academics to get frank reviews by students. And unfortunately, a lot of students just use the, use the system to abuse teachers and just have random nasty remarks, but some of them took it seriously. And I think that was, it was overall, it was a healthy advance, saving uh, a lot of students a lot of time and effort to have other students kind of get together and say, listen, this teacher does th these things well, but there's some glaring areas uh, for improvement and why not let, let the teacher know about that? And, and, and not to wax too philosophical here, there is, a, there is an ethical dimension to this. Um, when we put ourselves alongside of a student and, and truly seek input and then respond to legitimate input, virtue ethics is in play. We're cultivating the virtue of being a good leader by being sensitive to those we lead. And I think that that cascades generations into those we teach. We teach teachers how to teach by the way we teach our students. And it speaks to the, the word sensei, meaning one who has gone before, not to me, it doesn't mean one who is elevated exponentially above you and is aspirational. And it's more uh, a mentorship relationship where they've trod, trod the same path as you're trying to go and they may have experiences that they're sharing with you. Uh, I think that that could be really constructive. Okay, do we have anything else we want to do with this or uh, Chris is sitting quietly. Do you want to say anything before we uh, switch topics? Uh, I was just, you know, I was trying to identify what the problem is, like what problem are we trying to solve? Because uh, I start with that, you know, I'm kind of results based person. <laughs> And, and so usually I focus on that is, you know, what, what is the problem and what are we trying to solve? You know, then, then I look at, okay, what are we doing and how effective it is? And then if, if something needs to change, then, you know, we do it, you know, we make those changes, you know, potentially. Uh, you know, sometimes with the dojo, you know, if, if you travel, you get on a plane sometimes, uh, you see all sorts of different kind of passengers. Some of them show up with nothing or a backpack, and then others bring all sorts of pillows and things with them, you know. And, and so what happens is uh, it depends on how the individual sees that, that airplane trip, you know, for example. Some of them want to recreate their home situation wherever they go. And others just see it as a means of transportation, basically sit there, wait it out until you get to your destination. So I think whether it's a workplace, dojo, school, whatever it is, you see the same type of things, you know, happening, uh, you know, where people come in, maybe they want to wear what they want to wear, maybe, you know, they want it this way or that way. Well, preferences are one thing, but, um, I think they also need to be aware of where they're at and what the purpose for that place is, you know, and, and so the, the head instructor really needs to set the pace for that. You know, when you walk into to a dojo and everything's a, kind of a certain way, uh, I think there's more likelihood for people to say, all right, this isn't my kind of place uh, or, uh, you know, basically I'm going to get with the program. You know, so I'm, I'm not there to make everybody happy. I'd like for everybody to be happy. But, um, you know, we run things a certain way because we're trying to accomplish something. And I, I think over the years, you know, we've honed it down to, to what, what works well. Um, you know, if people want to accessorize and do things like that, you know, within reason, okay, but, you know, you're going to wear the same uniform 
you know, if your hair is, you know, more than shoulder length, it's, it's got to be tied up, you know, in, in some fashion. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, again, it's results driven. It's not a fashion show. It's not a, you know, don't, don't bring your house here, you know, basically this is, this is a different kind of a place. And I think it's important that, um, you know, we're one kind of a person, you know, it, it, you know, we don't want to be one kind of a person at work, one kind of a person at the dojo, one kind of a person, you know, with, uh, or a different kind of person with our friends and family. So our basic character and how we conduct ourselves, how we treat people, I think should be consistent, you know, no matter what environment we're in. That, I believe, is a big uh, part of people trusting you and, um, and, 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 and having a level of respect is that consistency. Again, you know, I don't think it's our job to make everybody happy you know, necessarily, but we want to be consistent and we want to be, you know, uh, transparent as far as what the purpose is, what the expectation is and all that. And, hey, you know, some people like chocolate ice cream, some people like vanilla, that's that's fine, but it's all ice cream. <laughs> so it just so happens I'm not serving 31 flavors. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a good summary. I mean, we, we, we have to have we have to have our standards. Um, we have the right to expect students to comply, and assuming those standards are reasonable and, and they're there. You know, my number one concern is safety. Um, and um, the students should be able to function within those frameworks. And you can have, within those framework, you can have you know, a lot of exchange of ideas. Uh, if those standards are in place and they're accepted by everyone, and I think I think that's I think that's what Chris is trying to say is that the, the standards have to be there, the framework has to be there. When the students come into the, a dojo, they need to see a certain environment, and if they can't function in that environment, uh, there's a bridge behind Chris, and maybe you got to walk across that bridge and find another dojo. <laughs> 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 or another yeah. Of life. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it, it, it's also, uh, you know, you have to think about, you know, what, what sets people off one way or the other. You know, what we generally experience, even in martial arts, you experience some kind of a grab or a hit, right? It's a physical thing that, that you're experiencing. But something was behind, before that physical thing happened, something else happened mentally psychologically, right? So, so certain thought processes, certain decisions, and then that physical thing manifested. Now, if you're a spiritual person, you want to go a, light, a layer deeper, you know, then, then I could say, well, it started off really spiritually with that person. Something, something was off balance or not there or whatever spiritually, which led to certain thought processes and certain choices, which ultimately resulted in something physical. So if you just deal with the physical, I mean, if, if there's an imminent physical thing, you got to deal with it. But if you just address things at a physical level, uh, you know, your success is going to be very limited. So at the very least, you have to go and, and build some kind of a relationship, you know, and, and if, you, if you're trying to be the, the head of the dojo, uh, you can't be buddy buddies with them. That doesn't mean you can't be friendly. <laughs> But you can't, it's too confusing for a person what your role is. You know, are you the parent or are you the friend? You know, basically. Uh, not to say you can't have elements of both, but, but it has to be a little more defined. And then, and then as you build that relationship, you start understanding, okay, that's why they're behaving this way physically and try to address it at that level. You know, and, and again, if you're, uh, you know, pastor or, you know, some, you know, somebody that, you know, is more attuned with spiritual things than, you know, I mean, we, we do that. I, I've <laughs> sometimes people ask, like, how do you do these things? How do you know these things? I say, I pull out the Bible, you know, here it is. This is where I get my, you know, it's not my stuff. You know, <laughs> I'm just basically taking it and, and playing it out, you know, this way. And oftentimes they're surprised. 
So you try to address things at the core level if you really want things to change. But for that to happen, you have to be consistent. You can't say, I, you know, I'm, I'm the instructor when I teach physical things. I'm your friend when I talk about, you know, uh, you know, mental psychological things. And then I'm your pastor when I talk about spiritual things. Are those three different people or is it the same person, you know? Okay. I think it has to be the same person. <laughs> I, I think the yeah. key word was yeah. consistency. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's, let's, uh, unless someone wants to add something else here, let's see if we can move on to the second topic, which is a totally different area. Um, and has discussed the idea of, of moving from block to immediate engagement with an attacker or using karate and kung fu language block to hit. I'm thinking here of flow and economy of motion. Um, um, sensei, if I, if I can interrupt for just a second, can we uh, maybe funnel the focus into that, of that question? Because uh, I was actually just about to ask you um, of your opinion and um, your philosophy behind circle theory. And maybe we can use that information to answer this question. It sounds like uh, that would work succinctly very well for both my intentions and the in intentions of the, of the asker. Professor, I'm the one who asked that question. So if you'd like me to oh. just elaborate a bit, I will. What, what motivates it? Am I all right to, oh, oh, to oh. elaborate a little bit okay. on that? Um, I think, how do you say it, you, you have to, con you, you have to, in a three situation, you have to look at the situation. Sometimes you can just do a hard solid block and that'll stop a fight. I've seen it happen hmm. because then the aggressor realizes there's a lot more here than I anticipated and I don't want to mess with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's one approach, and, and I've seen it happen. Um, the other approach is from block to immediate engagement. Um, there are two things. One, one is a circle theory. The other is using the other person's key. With a block, I differentiate between a, a block and a deflection. A, a block, you're stopping the direction of the key flow or the energy. And let's say you block a hit, you go into a, a sort of guard or a sweeping throw. That would be a block. You have to block because you're moving in the opposite direction of his energy. So you have to cancel that, that hit out of that energy flow. Most times, if you're doing other techniques, you want to deflect, which is redirect that energy. And there's a thing that Mark Tucker says often. He says, most of us think that our heads are really big targets, but they aren't. And if you can move the direction of that hit, maybe two or three inches either way, and of course you move your body and head, you're not going to get hit. You don't need to stop all that energy. You can use it. And if, if you block, you can block and trap and then go into whatever technique you want to do. Uh, and as Seki said, helping the attacker go in the direction he wanted to go. Because Seki's attitude was people, are, people who attack you physically are sick and they need help. And by executing jujitsu techniques, you help them go in the direction they want to go. That's a weird mindset, but it's probably essential. Um, because none of us want to hurt a person. Our, you know, your intent can never be to injure or hurt another person. Your intent is to protect yourself from, you protect yourself from injury and help this person go in the direction they want to go. Um, I, I think when you're moving into a technique, uh, what do we got here? Um, I, I, think, I think it, I use deflections a lot because it just makes it easier to go into techniques and the person really doesn't sense what's going on until it's too late for them. And that's another thing you're going after. Um, we'll also sometimes integrate hits with blocks 
Uh, I know Mark Tucker because he's, he's practiced Krav Maga. Uh, he'll block and strike at the same time. Um, I will block with one hand and perhaps strike with my elbow as my body is moving in. So there's no retraction. It's just one, it's just a smooth movement. And the strike with my elbow, perhaps to his ribs or solar plexus, is a, is a distraction. I don't care whether it works or not. In terms of physical injury, it takes their mind off of what I want to do for a fraction of a second. So my response is, I think you, you, if, if, if you're going to move from a block to an immediate engagement, you have to use it. You, you should be, it's easier to use a deflection and, and move your technique in a, in a circular direction um, because most techniques are circular anyway. And, and if you do it right, and this is one of the things I bring up in my next book, if it ever gets a contract or published, is we, we all know that if, if we do a technique correctly, our attacker will end up at our feet in front of us. We've changed our position, but they will end up in front of us so we can do whatever we need to do next. And that's, that's kind of an extension of the circle theory itself. You're, bring, you're bringing that technique back to your hara or psyche tandon, back to your center. And if you, if you do it any tech, almost any technique without using another person, you just go through the motions. Almost every technique will take your hands back to your center. Uh, try it. You'll find it, it's, it's, it's almost like Tai Chi. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting experience. And, and uh, uh, when I go out for walks sometimes in the morning, I'll go, I'll practice techniques and people look at me weirdly, but that's okay. Um, but, but it always returns, it always returns to your center. Circle theory, I don't know. I think that's, am I, am I answering myself or have I gone off on some tangent? No, no, this, this is beautiful. Keep going. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did I address your concern, Thomas, or? Yes, sir, you did. I, um... The, the genesis of the question is uh, in some of my continuing education, I'm, I'm doing praying mantis and they, they do a lot of uh, touch sensitivity flow drills, uh, learning to yield and then control. And there's a, I, it seemed to me there was a direct crossover into to the circularity of jujitsu there that as I yield, deflect for example then i can move for example into a trite was into a joint lock and so on and uh, my instinct is to yield and and keep moving occasionally though you're right um the block is what the chef ordered and that's what you cook <laughs> you know or what was ordered so yeah that helps thank you yeah it, it uh i think i've only well you <laughs> go back to when I was I don't know was in high school or something my, my mom went to hit me once and I blocked her that was not a good move uh, <laughs> it was just an automatic reaction <laughs> poor judgment but uh, <laughs> uh, my dad was very upset with me but um, in, in any case yeah you, you uh, a block usually infers that you don't want to get involved in this and uh uh but it's a really quick judgment call uh i don't like if you're going to commit yourself to defending yourself you you have to commit commit yourself to completing whatever you're doing and that's going to occur without any mental effort on your part because if you have to think your way through a technique on the street you're dead meat um whatever you do has to be automatic um i mean whether it be a throw or a takedown or you know getting around behind doing a nerve attack uh i'd love to get for those of you who remember star trek i'd love to get spock's i've used that by the way a lot i've never been able to put anyone out with it <laughs> I'd love to be able to get it that far with touch, 
but I've used it and it works very effectively where you can just come around, come around sometimes notch, notch into their, their neck and just dig in with your middle finger and they go down. Um, and then once you're down and you let go, they're out of pain. Um, but I'd like, I'd like to be able to do what Spock was able to do. Uh, <laughs> yes, Thomas. Well, uh, something I would like to be able to do with Spock too and i don't want my wife to be able to do it um <laughs> one thing that you said that triggered a thought is it, when i think about cultivating a, a emotion response an instinctive response i find myself the longer i do this i i want to instinctively without thinking create control and then have to think about if i'm going to finally incapacitate the person um and i, I find that the yielding and uh, the deflecting does put me in a position to control. And then if I want to, if I need to finish and incapacitate, then I, I, I can be deliberate. Um, I, I'm not saying that's a final thought in my mind, but that's, that's kind of how it's developed now coming up on four decades. So. Okay. Just a second. I have to let the dog outside, but you can continue with Derek. Just a second. The, the interesting thing is, uh, if you dig into the, to the language, especially in Japanese, uh, there's really nothing in the vocabulary that uh, equates to a block. So everything happens one of two ways uh, when there's something coming at you. One is basically to receive. And this is where the, the circular type of uh, uh, philosophy comes in. So to receive is kind of like being a net. So something is coming at you and, and it's not a hard surface. It's something that receives that oncoming force. And of course that builds energy and then you can release the energy back, redirecting it one way or the other. So in general, it's, uh, it's basically an elliptical shape where it's vertical or it's a circular shape uh, when it's horizontal. So the, the other term is to deflect. Uh, and the deflect is same thing, same thing, something, some force is coming at you. So you do a counter strike. So it's an even, even a regular, what we would call a block, you know, this type of stuff. It's actually a counter strike where you're knocking it off its trajectory. So, so there's no, if you're having to actually block, like building a wall and, you know, you can't get past this type of stuff. You've basically failed in your technique. <laughs> so because because you got you just covering and bracing yourself, you know, and eventually that gets torn down, too. So you're either receiving something and redirecting it, you know, via some circular motion or you're knocking it off its trajectory. But there's no such thing as a true block. So if you think about it that way. Then if you train that way and you practice that way, uh, then you're never going to, well, I shouldn't say never, but you're less likely to become rigid and try to absorb, you know, things just by a true block. Okay. Anywhere else? Anywhere else? Chris, Go ahead. Chris, there might be some people who, who would, would claim that a true block is when you stop the opponent's with your face <laughs> well <laughs> sounds like they've tried it a few times if they're a few times before, if they're going to claim that <laughs> so, so, somehow I don't get this one okay. yeah there's Dave, there's Dave, always Dave, things Dave. lost then there's always things lost in translation, you know, when you when you go from one language to the next. Uh, you know, Budo is the same thing. We call it martial arts, but in fact, that's not what the characters, you know, represent. You know, so so that's where we, you know, we start using English terms that aren't quite accurate, and then our practice evolves to reflect our definition. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh Okay, let's try the next topic here uh, as we move along. This is going to be a fun one. It's either going to be really long or very short. Um, which martial art is best? 
is combining when you like. Okay, is combining parts of many arts together into a hybrid, creating your own martial art, an effective martial art. Someone want to deal with that? I'm no. I'd like to jump in for just a moment. Um, just like the best musicians play more than one instrument, at least two, often three. Um, the, the, the finest martial artists I've ever uh, encountered seem to have more than one black belt. They've excelled in at least two martial arts. Um, and uh, they complement each other. And um, um, perhaps, um, and at least in my experience, makes what they use more effective. Um, so uh, is that a hybrid of, of sorts? Dave, I see what, I see what you're saying with that. Um, you know, I, I've done jujitsu as my primary um, martial art forever. Um, but before doing that, I had, I did a lot of boxing and, and the technical aspect of being able to strike and using those methods and striking and footwork and, and those type of things certainly help in, enhance my ability to perform jujitsu. I agree. Um, I have a boxing background too because my first karate sensei um, was had a record of thirty five and two in the ring, uh, mm -hmm. boxing. So he brought a lot of boxing to my karate, um, and I I'm thankful for that. Um, and that was um, uh, before I I like you before I uh, immersed myself in this. Um, so, anyways. Um, uh, on your point, Dave, I think that's, uh, and I, if, if whoever asked the question is on this call, I, I don't mean this to be too direct, but the, that question strikes me as a very Western minded question in, in this regard, that there's a best and a less best. Um, uh, my mother art is Shaolin. I came to jujitsu in the early nineties. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that for TJ, the way I look at it is, the best one is the path I'm on and walk that path. And if that's my way, it may have other elements today, but tomorrow it won't. That doesn't mean I don't dedicate myself to something primarily. Um, I, 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 I personally find the same response in me to, is there a best martial art to, is there a best church in town? <laughs> It's just not that simple. Yeah, and um, you know, sometimes if if you're if you're looking at it um, and trying to establish some external standard, for instance, with BJJ and its excellence for groundwork within a certain context of competing with another person to do something to submit them, then it's undeniable that that has tremendous value in that very in that limited context. But if you, if you remove that context, there are so many weaknesses in BJJ. Um, but within the context of mixed martial arts, it's tremendously valuable. So it all seems very contextual. And once you submit yourself to a certain way or you follow a path for years and years, the way kind of it becomes self-perpetuating and you think, wow, this is, really, this is really wonderful that I've been led down this path. But it makes sense to remind yourself that this is, you've it's given yourself a context in which excellence is established by the boundaries of that that martial art. So it, it all it depends on how you're analyzing it and what context you're establishing for assessing martial art. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put in my biased view here. Uh, uh, I'll usually, if people ask me what martial art is best, I will usually say all martial arts have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, there's, there's no one martial art that is best. You need to find the art that works best for you. Uh, they all have, they all have strengths. And like I said, they all have strengths and weaknesses. I'll say to me, the advantage of traditional jujitsu is that ultimately it gives you the most options in terms of dealing with an attacker a potential attacker uh, 
it also makes you unpredictable for the very same reason. Nobody knows how you're going to respond. You probably don't even know how you're going to respond. The, the disadvantage of jiu -jitsu, traditional jiu-jitsu is because there's so much more in it, it takes a lot longer to learn. You know, those are the, those are the, the pluses and minuses. Uh, and every every martial art has its strengths and weaknesses as, as I, I, you can probably compare that to other things in life as well. Um, and, and I'll tell that to students the first night because I want to be totally upfront with them. At the end of 10 weeks, you're not going to be a black belt. At the end of, at the end of 10 weeks, you should be a green belt. And in some place between four and seven years, you'll be a black belt. And that's kind of the reality of things. Um, some students move faster, some students move slower, but you know, it's, uh, uh, that's, that's my response to which martial art is best. As far as hybrid is concerned, there are people that mix things together and the, those, that mixture, that hybrid works for them. And okay, that's the way it is. You know, you, you can't say that's good or bad or anything. It's just, it works for them. Um, I think I don't, and even in jujitsu, for those of us who practice traditional jujitsu, each of us has our own specialties within that art. And there are things we have a quote unquote tendency to do more often than others because they work better for us. Uh, and our problem is that we can't afford to just practice only those things that work for us because then we end up with a very narrow uh, scope of things to teach or practice or what have you. And uh, we're not really practicing the art. As far as putting together a martial art, a bunch of hybrids into a, a martial art, I don't know whether that works. I, I think what you have to do is if if you can get that whatever you have come up with is going to go two or three generations then maybe it has a chance of being a martial art standing on its own but if you just create something and say this is hop chop for um and i'm the all high poobah um you're the all high poobah okay fine and when you get bored with what you're teaching and close the book, then so does Hop Chop Foy. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a martial art. That means it's your hybrid, you know, what you, what works for you and what, what may or may not work for other people. So Usually I think the reason that, that a, um, a number of people choose to excel in, in, in two, two martial arts um, perhaps similar reason why you uh, studied with uh, with um, uh, Professor Brosius uh, uh, along with uh, Sensei Seki is uh, improved perspective. Yes, Seki Brosius was total, is totally different from Seki. Um, <laughs> Se, how do you say? Seki taught me art very politely. Uh, Hal Brocious, I think either being with the Boston or Chicago police, one of the two had a very street oriented <laughs> attitude. <laughs> and and so his stuff works, but it isn't as I'm not putting down Seki. Uh, some of Seki's stuff is looks very artsy compared to Hal's stuff, but Hal's stuff works. Um, and that's what's amazing. And when I first came in, went into his class, I said, how does this stuff work? It looks so clumsy and awkward, but you know, you if you're going to, I say, you need to have an open mind. And ultimately I realized because I was looking for some things that weren't in, in Seki's teachings. That's why you learn another martial art sometimes is to get, you know, I sense something is missing here. I want to expand my skill level. And uh, both Seki and, and Brocious knew what I was doing. I was very upfront with both of them. If you ever do that or your students do that, 
they, they have to be upfront. And I simply told them, <clears throat> you know, they said, both of them said the same thing. You can practice the other art, but it stops at the door. You, Seth would say, you don't bring brochures and stuff into my dojo. And Hal basically said, don't bring Seki stuff into my dojo. And you have to, you have to respect that. Um, and I've lost a couple of black belts because of that. They, they've tried to bring in other martial arts and uh, one of them to the extent I tried proselytizing to my students in class that whatever they were learning was better than what I was teaching. And uh, we had a discussion. <laughs> and I, I, <laughs> did. And I, I, had, I basically said, you know, it's totally inappropriate and you have a decision to make. You either respect my wishes or as Seki said, what's the magic three words? There's the door. There's the door. There's the door. You know, <laughs> and he chose the door. Uh, Professor, you know, um, if, if when you're done, if I, I've, I have one I'm more done. thought on that. Uh, um, one thing that we have integrated over the years in my academy is uh, if a student, once a student attains Shodan level, in order for them to go to Nidan, they have to not only learn the requisite Nidan curricula, but they can pick any of the other arts that I teach or they can find an outside source, but they got that it's required to demonstrate that they have at least attained an intermediate level in another art before they could be showed on or need on with us. And that's simply so that they're broader and we don't become siloed. Uh, one of the frustrating things about academics is all of them are convinced many times that their discipline is the discipline. Why doesn't all the funding go here? Well, it's never that simple. And so I found that to be helpful. Um, I, uh, it's something that I learned from my first jujitsu sensei uh, who taught Kenpo and I learned Kenpo from him as well. And that's a good way to broaden students. And it's interesting. This is anecdotal, so I can't, uh, it doesn't apply everywhere, but I've never had a student later come at, at a second or third degree and say, we clearly have the best art. <laughs> they said, we have a, a balanced art. And I think that's worth something. To add on to that really quickly, I found in, in my uh, expression of Budo Shin, um, I uh, take it, I take the concepts and I apply it to like combat sports because I've been doing combat sports forever and I don't like want to stop doing that, right? But I also like really enjoy traditional martial arts and Budo Shin. So like the systems and the way of thinking in Budo Shin is top tier. Um, so I have been working on applying those things into my uh, combat sports techniques and I've had really good success with it. So I think like um, whether you're, you know, taking literal techniques or taking the application of those techniques, either way, like I think you can still call it that thing, right? So if you like apply your karate style techniques to your kickboxing, you can still call it karate because you're not so much focused on the name, but it's function, and you can still tie that function back to the name. Yeah. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> like the way your mind works. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, uh, Chase is working on my next book. That's one of the things. That comes up. <laughs> Don't open this door for me, Sensei. <laughs> It'll be done. Oh my gosh! I was just about to ask when the next book is coming out. That since you mentioned it, well, I'm, I'm 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 hoping at some point that I'll get a contract for it. They've been. Uh, I was talking with Darren before this meeting. We uh, uh, sometimes, if if you do get into writing a book or stuff like that, uh, you have the one first thing you need to learn is patience. Um, oh, I know Black Belt has sometimes said, I'll write an article for Black Belt, or you know, hopefully they'll, you know, thinking that maybe someday they'll publish it. And there are times where I've had to wait a couple, three years. <laughs> for it. Yeah. And same thing for a book contract. Sometimes it's a couple, you wait a couple of years. And it's just a matter of having patience. Uh, and, and, and fortunately, Black Belt doesn't require that you, uh, after the first book, 
they never required that I write a complete book again before I submit it. Uh, it was usually just oh. a topical outline of two chap one or two chapters. Uh, and, and once you get with a publisher and they know what, just generally, and they know what you're capable of doing, they really will usually cut back on the sweat and tears that you have to put forth, the, that you put forth the first time. Uh, mm. because they know you so it's just that's just some general information um, what are some things you talk about in the in the next book are there any like uh... they're basically the, the next book theory I, it, it, this theoretical title is is secrets which really isn't secrets it's just a lot of subtle things that are done in jujitsu that aren't really visible they're really simple things that make techniques more effective mm. um Oh, good then. Just, just a really simple one. If, if you know, take it for if, if I can borrow for Absolutely. Darren here yes, for a yes, second. Coming up, you know, under, under the chin for the for the for the choke, you know, cross lapel choke. Mm -hmm. uh, and Seki would tell us, "This is illegal in judo, but if they don't see you do it on a submission, hey. you're okay." Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and one of the small things, for example, is once you're down here and you're on your body's hiding all of this is you can take your forearm rather than just pulling and going in is just vibrate your forearm. Oh, and so it's a, it's a book just on minute adjustment. Just, yeah, this, just in here. And That's it, amazing. It, it's exceedingly annoying and the person will tap out right away. Yeah. It's, oh, just, yeah, for sure. it's just annoying and it hurts. But those are, are little, you know, just samples of little things that that's one of the main topics. Little things you can do in, in technique execution that will make the technique work a lot easier and faster and better for you. Oh, that's, I but cannot just, wait. It's, 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 it's like uh, some people in, in judo for throws that they will grab with and they'll have their, they'll have their thumb out. Mm -hmm. And the problem with in, in judo is if, if, if you have your thumb like this, or it's trapped in here, either side, and the person, they're wearing a gi, and they roll, they can trap and break your thumb. Oh. And I, and I've seen it happen. And that will stop a judo match real fast. So mm -hmm. what you do is, I'm giving my way my trade secrets here, <laughs> rather than grabbing like this, you, you grab with your fingers, but not your thumb. Your, your thumb is against, these are little things that Seki taught him too. He says, you know, you don't mm -hmm. want to injure yourself. So if you're grabbing, mm -hmm. if you're grabbing someone's collar or shirt or whatever, you don't have your thumb opposite. Now this, doing it this way, it is a slight, it is a weaker, it is a weaker hold. I mean, there's no argument. This, this mm -hmm. is weaker than this on an article of clothing. Yeah. But this can get you a broken thumb. This won't. Especially in like transition, if you have like a double collar, maybe maybe like a sleeve collar and you're going for that high elbow. Yeah. Um, Shoulder throw, like, that, yeah. well, that won't really matter. That might, that might give you a stronger grip this way because you're going this yeah. way anyway. No, when you're going back like that, what you have to, we're gonna, some, <laughs> when you go back like that, some people mm -hmm. pull this way, okay? And what that does by having, by having your wrist backwards, that's very weak and you've got, to, he resists, you've got a broken wrist here. Okay. So what you do is when you grab this, you grab and you pull you're pushing forward with your whole arm. So oh. your wrist is straight. You don't want your wrist bent backwards because that's, you're asking to get injured. Hmm. If, if so instead of a, of a more of a throwing, it's more of a punching kind it, yeah, type of motion? It's, yeah, because that way gotcha. your whole arm, okay. everything is there. Your wrist is protected. You're safe. Okay. And well, it, it may mean rather than grabbing here and turning, you may have to grab a little <laughs> over on his chest so you can come around, but you, you've got to keep that. You need to protect your wrist. Wrist is a very weak joint. But anyway, so. Okay, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you come in, right? And you turn it and then punch it through. Yeah, you've got to get yourself sense. under it. You've got okay. to get yourself under it so you can, so you. Right, can. right. Like that. Oh, that makes way more sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, and I feel that. everything is all of your muscles are lined up properly. Yeah. Oh, look at that. And you can you have a lot more control too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah, and and that's what yeah. you want. Anyway, so there, there, there's a lot of that stuff in the book. I'm waiting. I'm so like a hungry I. rat. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> but if you let those books get get uh, gone away from me, they, they start to become a small house down payment. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you who saw me, uh, uh, this the other day, someone asked me if if they knew where I could get them a copy of uh, the Jute book. So I went on to oh. Amazon. I mean, I've seen it at you know three, four hundred dollars, five hundred. What for the book? You know. And are you, you are you, you're sitting down, right? It was thirty one thirty one hundred twenty three dollars for the <laughs> what for the Jute book. I could not believe it. There's not many out there. <laughs> I'll sell mine for thirty one twenty two. I have two copies, TJ. <laughs> so I, Smart. I, that was a good investment. <laughs> I've, got, I've got two copies too. <laughs> Plus one with the spine cut off. Um, but anyway, so I jokingly sent an email to Robert Young and I said, uh, why don't you talk with Century Martial Art? Maybe they'll bring the book back in print. In print. And uh, he said, I forwarded your email to them. But anyway, don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyhow, um, I, I think... Anybody else want to say anything about hybrid martial arts or the topic? <laughs> <laughs> Save it, John. Don't loan it out to anyone. You know, which, which is a real quick, quick issue to bring up. I, I used to loan books out until I lost some really good ones and I couldn't get copies of them anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 you know, 10, 12 years ago, I changed my attitude and uh, I don't loan, bo loan books out to anyone any longer because just, you know, if they're out of print and they lost it um, and you're out of luck. I mean, it's a sad commentary, but, you know, okay. Uh, do we want to... Uh, Get on to question the, the fourth question, or it's it's about nine seventeen now, or do we want to save it for next time? What's the question? Oh, the question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have them all. You don't have all two hundred and thirty-five in front of you. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> the question is: Sometimes we te teach practical stuff. Sometimes we want to teach some basics such as water the plants that they may grow. Sometimes they ask, when and why would you I do this? And the answer scares them away. Do we want to deal with it? This is a really philosophical question. We could spend a couple of days on it, I think. Um, Good place to start next week. Yeah, probably next week, because that's OK. Now, one other thing I'd like you to do, because we all have them. Um, there's a question that says debunking martial arts myths. Okay. A myth is a past tense of moth. But anyway, uh, um, what I'd like you to do is jot down any myths that you have heard and send them to me. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got four here already, such as uh, taking a martial art will make you invincible. Uh, especially if you learn my my martial my style, you can beat up anyone. I know the death touch, uh, breaking wood and bricks. You know that if you heat up pine in an oven for an hour at four hundred and seventeen degrees, it really breaks really easily. Um, and it. If, if bricks have a high, so the higher the sand content, the easier it is to break them. I'm not saying that there's not skill involved, but um, things you have to be aware of. Uh, the little old martial artists, sensei, are the most dangerous ones. 
So when you that get one's, your- that one's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that one too. Yeah. That's the, uh, uh, anyway, so if you can think, if, if you've heard of any and think of any, um, j- just send them to me because it'd be nice to have a list. Cause I think this, that would be a really, that would be a really fun topic to deal with. Well, there's the, there's the classic one, Sensei. I'm surprised you don't have that one already. It's registering your hands as lethal weapons. Oh, yes. Registering your hands is right. Register. Right. That's a really old one. Yeah. All right. And I think the same thing is that if you have a black belt in karate, you have to register with the police. Okay. See, now you're getting me going. Register with police. Okay. So if you have, can think of any, you know, just they're out there. Uh, just, just send them to me because, you know, there's nothing wrong with having fun topics one session. Anyway, uh, I'll get this out to you early next week. And I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us. I know Jonathan didn't say much today. Uh, and Chase, is this our first time with you? No, this is like the fourth. Fourth, great. Thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for participating. Thank everyone for participating. Uh, and uh, we will meet again in uh, on the 18th of December. And <clears throat> in January, we will not meet on January 1st. Um, because it's New Year's Day. And so that month we'll be meeting the second and fourth week, I think, in January. So just in, in case you want to put it up on your calendar ahead of time, you know, for those of you who plan ahead, for those of us who plan ahead. Um, and, and don't get a, who was it, my, my Samsung Android. <clears throat> for some reason, it decided to do a system upgrade and that system upgrade erased my calendar. Um, I'm still figuring out what things I need to do in this month. But anyway, and that's my... <laughs> anyway, I want to thank Darren for showing up. Thank you, Sensei. It's okay. my honor for, for allowing me to come and, today. Uh, 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 now we're going to go out to breakfast, and then he's going to drive back to uh, New Orleans <laughs> today. Uh, he should be there by tonight. And... <laughs> straight through. Straight through. Anyway. So I want to thank you for being here. Thank you, Sensei. It's my anyway, honor. Anyway, so any, any other thoughts before we say goodbye today? No, we're being awfully quiet. <laughs> okay. So I want you to have a, a great week. Uh, there are no holidays this week. And uh, we'll, we'll see you all on the 18th. Uh, when our first topic will be, sometimes we teach practical stuff, sometimes we don't. And I'm one of the guilty parties, too. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> so, take care. Since Thank you. Since I, I will say one thing. Everyone here would like to be where Darren is right now. It would be really neat if we could pull everyone together. That would be really cool. Would be. Yes, yes, it would be. Since uh, I'm, I'm going to be out in your neck of the woods in June, and I'm hoping to take my rental car and get permission from my wife to come up and hopefully see you so <laughs> Where, whereabouts would you whereabouts would you be i'm going to be in anaheim uh but okay. we're flying into lax so okay are you going to visit disneyland yes uh, my daughter is a musician and we're going to nam in anaheim uh, uh okay. and and uh what we are going to do some drive and that's a conference where i don't have to be there since my wife is so i'll have free time and that's what i'm thinking oh i'm gonna go see professor kirby if he's available <laughs> you, know, you gotta go do you gotta do the star wars ride that, that is so cool certainly i think it's the best ride in both parks anyway <laughs> anyway have a great weekend we'll see you next week two weeks Thank you. Have a good Bye, everybody. Everybody. take care Bye. thank you sensei